The Vape Passion Show, episode 85. In this episode, we're going to talk about an e-juice review for Razzle Taz by J-Juice. The CDC says smoking in movies causes teen smoking. Nicopure has filed an appeal in the Nicopure vs. FDA lawsuit. An engineer discovers why the smoke AL85 is dying. And a poll shows that most vapors use both pre-built coils and hand-wrapped coils. Hey, welcome back to the Vape Passion Show. I'm Alex, this is episode 85, and I'm recording this on Sunday, September 3rd. If you're planning on buying a vape product anytime soon and you want to support the show, go to vapepassion.com vendors and buy from one of those links. There are more than 50 popular vendors listed. I'll get a small commission for referring you, but it doesn't cost you anything extra. And if you don't want to listen to this whole show, most of the segments will be published separately in the next few days. I hope you all had a good weekend. I had a, a great three-day weekend for Labor Day. Uh, I spent a lot of time with my daughter since I had the last week off from school, so that was nice. Uh, yesterday I went to my mom's for a barbecue and that was awesome, but the new school term starts this week, so back to the grind. Um, anyway, did any of you guys get anything cool for Labor Day sales? Uh, I ordered a few things myself. Nothing crazy, but still some good stuff. Um, I'm not sure if you if you caught my uh, Facebook post or my Twitter post, but VolcanoEcigs.com was selling the Lava Box M for only $24 with a coupon code. And that's a DNA 75 device that normally sells for something like $70. So I hope you guys got in on that. That will be my first DNA device, so I'm really excited to get it. As for what I'm using this week, I'm actually using a few things. I'm using the original 80 watt iStick Pico Mega, uh, the Asvape Cobra sub ohm tank, and the SigPet Eco RDA, and the Asvape Michael Mod. I'm loving all of these things. Uh, the Cobra tank has great flavor, but there are some cons with it. Keep an eye out for my review to learn more. Uh, the SigPet Eco RDA is great. Um, it also has some cons, mainly with the design, but performance is awesome. It feels almost exactly like the SigPet Eco 12 tank, which I loved. Now for the Pico, it's cool too, except that it can only fit 23mm or smaller diameter tanks because of the battery cap that protrudes from the top of the device. And that leads me to a question that I have for you. Do you have a recommendation of a nice, short, rebuildable tank that I can use on this? Something 23mm or less? I have several 22 millimeter tanks, but they're all too long. I want something really short for the Pico. I've thought about sanding down the side of the cap that faces the tank. Um, I've seen people do it, and the cap always goes into the same place, so it'll work. Um, so I only have to do the one side. And I just might do that, but I'm still interested in tank recommendations if you have them. So for the Asvape Michael, um, this was sent to me by av40.com. This device is sweet. It just looks so freaking cool. This is one of those devices that you pull out and people look at it like it's a piece of art. And really it is. There are two designs available for this and another design on the way. They sent me the one with zombies on it, which is called the Walking Dead Edition. There are only two cons that I can think of so far on this. The price and the battery door. The battery door slides into place and it seems a little loose. I actually worry about it falling off in my pocket. And the price is $110, so it's pretty steep. But this thing is sweet. This isn't just a, a sticker on here either. This is like a rubbery plastic material. So it's pretty nice. So I've received a comment on one of my past videos asking me to do a tutorial on refilling the Enjoy pre-fill tanks. People have said that it's possible, but I haven't seen a video for it, and I haven't been able to do it myself. I read that if you rock the tank back and forth with some force, eventually it will pop off the base, but I just can't get it. So if any of you have done it or have any tips for me, please let me know. I'd like to do it. Uh, you could even send me a video of yourself doing it if you'd like, and I'll put it on the show. Um, other news, uh, the giveaway for the Smoke Cooper Mini is over, and the winner for that was Eugene, uh, who has been a subscriber of mine since nearly b the beginning of my channel, so I'm happy for him. Uh, I know a lot of you entered, and I wish I could give you all a prize, but stay tuned because I have another giveaway that I will be starting by the time you watch this, uh, by the time you listen to this. So this next giveaway, it might not appeal to all of you because this is for previously used items, uh, the OBS Sub-Engine and the OBS Sub-Engine Mini. These aren't the rebuildable models, by the way. Uh, they're pretty much in mint condition and were only used for my review. I've also cleaned them out, so they should be good to use right away. There will be two winners. The first prize winner gets whichever model they want. Uh, they are, they're both basically exactly the same, except for that one holds 5.3 mils of e-juice and the other holds 3.5 mils of e-juice. They're decent tanks, I just don't use them, so I wanted to pass them on. And this one is only for U.S. residents, so I'm sorry to any of my listeners outside of the U.S. It's just that I'm paying shipping out of my own pocket, and the cost to ship internationally just costs too much. 
and it would cost nearly as much as these things are worth. So moving on, just a, a few quick news updates to start with this week. So Mooch, the battery testing wizard, just released some testing notes on the Brilli Power 2600 milliamp hour 40 amp 18650 battery. The first thing that he points out is that the 40 amp rating on the wrap is absurd. And if you look at Mooch's ratings, there are no batteries on the market that can actually do 40 amps. He's rating it at 20 amps with a max capacity of 25 amps. The capacity rating is 2600 milliamp hours, but Mooch found it to be 2500. So not a huge difference, but still overrated. Uh, the wrap also says it's an IMR battery, but it doesn't actually use the IMR chemistry. So basically, this is on his list of batteries that you should not buy. And then uh, Phil Basardo, he just announced that he is no longer working with Molecule Labs or the BE Liquid line of eJuice that he created in partnership with them. He hasn't explained anything further than this at this point, uh, as far as I know, but he posted the announcement on his website simply saying that he's no longer affiliated with the manufacturer or the eJuice line. He said that he has no idea what the future is for the line and he has no control over it and that he's currently seeking other opportunities. So hopefully things work out for Phil. And now some quick updates on vape legislation. Uh, Detroit Lakes, Minnesota is discussing an ordinance that would raise the minimum age to use tobacco products to 21. This also includes vapor products. The city council will be meeting publicly on September 12th at 5 p.m. So if you live in the city of Detroit Lakes, send an email to council members and go to casa.org, C-A-S-A-A.org to find more details. And then in Pennsylvania, they're still battling the 40% wholesale tax on vapor products. So vaping groups are fighting to get this wholesale tax changed to a 5 cent per milliliter tax, but lobbyists and lawmakers are urging for a 10 cent per mil tax or higher, which would be higher than the current 40% wholesale tax. So if you live in Pennsylvania, CASA is asking that you call and send emails to Speaker of the House Mike Terze and Majority Leader Dave Reed. Uh, go to CASA.org for more details. And I'll have links to both call to actions for these in the show notes. And then Tulsa, Oklahoma is proposing an ordinance that would fine anyone smoking or vaping on city-owned property. It's already illegal to vape in city-owned buildings, but this new law would make it illegal on the property as well and would result in an up to $100 fine. This includes city-owned parks, recreation areas, golf courses, and detention ponds. Uh, Bruce Dart, the, Tul the Tulsa Health Department Executive Directory, said that science has concluded that vaping is dangerous, which is false. So, the city council already met on Wednesday last week, but I haven't seen any updates. But if you live in Tulsa, contact CASA or your local vape advocacy group, if you have one, to see if there's anything you can do. Okay, now let's do an e-juice review of Razzletaz by J-Juice. So, J-Juice gave this sample to me for the purpose of this review. Everything that J-Juice makes is made in the USA. It has traceable batch codes and is made with GMO-free, USP grade, and kosher VG and PG. Their description for this e-juice says, you will wake up, vape, and repeat with this pure berry blend of delight. Enjoy yourself, incorporating pure raspberry, blackberry, and blueberry. It doesn't have a strong smell at all. I can, I can barely even smell it, actually. It smells a little fruity, but the smell is pretty weak. So for this review, I'm using the Goon 22 on the iStick Pico Mega. It's built at 0.16 ohms, 69 watts. The flavor is fruity, but like the smell, it's very, very mild. Since I know that this is a berry flavored e-juice, I can sort of get a sense of those flavors in here, but it would be damn near impossible if I didn't know what this was, was supposed to be. I can get the raspberry and blackberry, but not the blueberry at all. It's a little like fruit, not very sweet. It seems like it might not have any sweeteners at all, which I know some people really like. The throat hit is a little harsh for me, but that's probably because I'm sensitive to fruit flavors, especially berries. Even though the flavor isn't strong, it's actually kind of nice. It has an interesting aftertaste that I really like, kind of like a dry, powdery, candy sweetness. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, you can get it in nicotine strengths of 0, 3, and 6 from vapejjuice.com. You can get 10 mils for 595, 30 mils for 1697, and 60 mils for 2295. And if you buy three bottles, you get the fourth free. All right, now let's talk about a study. So in July 2017, the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, published a report about how smoking in movies can result in youth using tobacco products. They start out their report with some strong accusations. The report says that the former Surgeon General has concluded that there is a causal relationship between young people starting to smoke and depictions of smoking in movies. They claim that kids who are heavily exposed to smoking in movies are two to three times more likely to start smoking. The report says that from 2010 to 2016, there were fewer movies that had tobacco use in them compared to previous years, but that although there were fewer movies, there were more incidents within these movies of using tobacco products. The report also mentions that the number of times tobacco use has occurred in kids' movies has not decreased since 2010, and that tobacco use in all movies has increased by 72%. 
So if there has been no change in kids' movies and an increase in all movies, you'd expect smoking rates to go up, right? The CDC study claims that if there were fewer incidents of tobacco use in movies, fewer kids would become initiated to using tobacco themselves. So if that were true, certainly we'd see a correlation in tobacco use in movies and youth smoking. Well, the researchers didn't even put the two data sets together to compare. Um, I'm actually willing to bet that they did, because why wouldn't they? But they didn't want to publish the comparison because it shows that their study doesn't prove anything. Professor Brad Rodu graphed the data from the study, and we can easily and quickly see that none of what the CDC claimed is true. According to this data, tobacco incidence in movies has remained mostly the same on average, but declines in smoking with high schoolers has been dropping significantly since 1996. The decreases in smoking with kids doesn't appear to have anything at all to do with tobacco incidents in movies. There is no correlation whatsoever. You can also see how the research team has manipulated the data. In several instances, they compared 2010 to 2016, with 2010 having far fewer tobacco incidents in movies than in 2016. But they failed to provide context in the years prior to 2010 and in between 2016. They cherry-picked data. And they didn't even point out that while smoking in movies in 2016 was way up, the smoking rates with youth is at the lowest it's ever been. This wouldn't be as obvious if it, if it weren't on a line graph, but looking at Brad Rodu's graph, you can see that they picked two very contrasting years, but that neither year represents a pattern. All they really did with this study was point out that there is tobacco use in, in movies, and that some years it goes up. That's really it. Then they go on to voice an opinion that is not based on any factual evidence. Um, that reducing tobacco use in movies could reduce the risks of kid smoking. And can you guess who's behind this study? Dr. Stanton Glantz, the biggest opponent to vaping in all forms of tobacco and nicotine. He wants complete nicotine prohibition and will do and say whatever he can to persuade people to believe in him, um, which is pretty clear in this study. The discussion at the end of the study offers plenty of fear-mongering with nothing to back it up. Guy Bentley also published an interesting editorial on this in uh, on the WashingtonExaminer.com that points out the flaws in Glantz research about how much of the, the literature on this topic has been manufactured by Glantz and that how even other extremely anti-tobacco researchers have pointed out that these claims can't be proven. One study in 2011 actually tried to perform the same study that Glantz did and found that the correlation between smoking in movies and other types of adult content was so high that it was impossible to determine whether or not uh, youth smoking rates were actually influenced at all. And as Guy Bentley points out, it might actually be that since kids who smoke are more likely to be rebellious, they might be more inclined to watch movies featuring adult themes which just so happens to have smoking scenes in them. So there you go, another misleading study from Glantz. Okay, now some updates on vape litigation. So as you might have heard on July 21st, Judge Amy Berman Jackson ruled in favor of the FDA in the Nicopure vs. FDA lawsuit, leaving the FDA in full control of regulating vapor products as tobacco products. It was already expected that Nicopure would appeal the decision, and now that's what they've done. The CEO and co-founder of Nicopure Labs, Jeff Stamler, said, we believe the FDA is doing a massive disservice to public health and we will keep fighting for the vaping industry to ensure these products will continue to help a growing number of people quit tobacco and start a new smoke-free life. The Nicopure lawsuit argued that the FDA had overreached with their implementation of the deeming rule and that uh, the deeming rule violated the First Amendment and does not comply with the Administrative Procedure Act. So the appeal has been filed at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and Nicopure is joined by the R2B Smoke-Free Coalition in this appeal, according to the press release that Nicopure released. I don't think many people are expecting the appeal to result in a different outcome, but if there's a fighting chance, Nicopure should go for it. Um, it might not seem like an appeal would be successful in any type of lawsuit, but successful appeals actually happen all the time. Not so much in criminal law, because in most criminal cases, according to, to statistics, uh, the defendants are guilty. But in other areas of law, appeals can work. And this can work because an appeal requires that several other judges review the original court's decision. Some of these other judges just might disagree with Judge, Jack Judge Jackson, so there's no reason not to try an appeal. All right, now let's switch topics and talk about potential issues with the Smoke AL85 and uh, other smoke products, actually. So there's a user on Reddit named uh, Bad Conductor, uh, who is an engineer that does circuit design and failure analysis in his regular line of work. He also enjoys doing this stuff as a hobby. So he started publishing teardowns of devices that tend to fail. 
He's already done a teardown of the Smoke Alien 220, and he just published a teardown of the Smoke AL-85. Uh, the Smoke AL-85 has had reports of bricking for no clear reason. Uh, Bad Conductor received one of these dead devices to see if he could figure out what went wrong. I'm not going to discuss all of the technical details because it's ex extremely technical, and I'm not an engineer, but he does a full disassembly, a close look at the display, and a complete inspection of the PCB board, including looking at regulator circuitry, MOSFETs, the microcontroller, and connectors. He looks at everything basically. In the case of the smoke alien, he provided theories of why the device fails, but he wasn't completely certain. In the case of the smoke AL85, he said that failure was easy to figure out. The small switching regulator for the OLED display is boosting the voltage to 11.5 volts, which is higher than what it should be doing. Other displays usually call for 9 to 10 volts, so the high voltage seems to be causing a direct short on the screens. Using the device after the screen dies eventually leads to other failures within the device until it finally just dies completely. And you'll see many reports online from people continuing to use the Smoke Alien and the AL85 after the screen dies, and now you know why you shouldn't. Rather than the device turning into a brick, you might suffer a more serious failure, so don't risk it. Even though I don't understand everything in the teardown, it was a really interesting read. Uh, this guy is like the mooch of internal device components. I highly recommend following Bad Conductor on Reddit. He's also accepting broken devices for teardowns. Uh, I'm assuming he's looking for devices that are newer and more popular, since these re reviews are designed to prevent people from buying bad products. But uh, if you've got something to send, please do. I'd love to see this guy keep putting out these, these crazy thorough teardowns. And finally, I want to talk about a little study that I did myself. So during my last giveaway, I ran a poll. I asked entrants to answer one multiple choice question. Do you only build your own coils, buy only pre-built coils, or both? So 77 people answered the poll. 14% of people always build their own coils, 40% buy pre-built coils only, and 45% use both. So the majority of people use both, but a very large percentage of people do pre-built coils only. Only a small percentage of people use only their own hand-built coils. And I also looked at genders and ages. So both men and women tend to prefer using either only pre-built coils or using both pre-built and hand-built coils but men seem to be more likely to use only their own hand-built coils than women are. As far as age groups go, the majority of people who use only their own hand-built coils are 30 or under. From the ages 31 and up, these people tend to prefer pre-built coils. And I think this makes a lot of sense. When you get into your 30s, it's more likely that you have kids, a family, and a full-time job. Uh, you just don't have time to build your own coils all the time, but you may like to do it occasionally. So yeah, that's my own little mini-study. Of course, this was very non-scientific and open to errors. For example, uh, some people might not have understood the question, and they may have answered incorrectly, and the data was probably skewed a little bit towards my particular audience. You know, for like, for example, someone like Big Lou, if he ran this poll, I think the overall preferences would probably be similar, but the percentages would be very different. Probably more people building their own coils. Um, I'll be publishing more specific statistics on vapepassion.com if you want to check it out. But um, I know you all don't want to listen to me rattle off a bunch of percentages, so that's why I didn't go over it here. Anyway, I thought this was a really fun way of getting some interesting data about vaping. Uh, if you have some other ideas of other questions I can ask in polls in the future, please let me know. I'll try to do something like this for all of my giveaways. Okay, that's all I have for this week. You'll find the show notes for this episode on vapepassion.com. Just do a search for episode 85. If you want to support this show, consider donating to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash vapepassion. You can follow me on Twitter at vapepassion, and I'm also on Facebook. If you like this weekly show, please consider giving me a thumbs up on the video and subscribe to my channel if you're not already a subscriber. You can also subscribe to the podcast version of this show on either iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. If you'd like to get notifications of new reviews or of this show, you can sign up to receive my weekly email on vapepassion.com. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me or leave a comment on one of my videos. All right, I'll see you next week. 